Uh, it's my privilege today to moderate the, uh, the panel uh, that uh, you see in front of you today. We've got three experts uh, in uh, economics and, uh, and market development uh, and product uh, development as well. And so uh, I'd like to introduce them to you. And then I've got some questions that uh, we'll get them jump started on. And if you have any questions as they answer theirs, I want to keep this as informal as we possibly can. So don't hesitate to, uh, to ask. First of all, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Glenn Tonzer. Uh, Glenn is a professor in the Department of Agricultural Economics at Kansas State University. Uh, Dr. Tonzer has a broad interest and experience and span uh, of many issues throughout the meat livestock supply chain. Through active research, engaged outreach with industry and firsthand knowledge with livestock production, Glenn has economic experience in an array of topics economically important to Kansas, the United States, and our global stakeholders. Glenn, thank you for uh, putting yourself out and sharing with us today. Secondly, I'd like to introduce Dr. David Newman. Uh, Let's give it up for Dave. Dave just became the Senior Vice President of Market uh, Outreach for the National, National Pork Board. Board. Yeah, let's yeah. give it up for David. I had a chance to work with David uh, uh, my first year on the Pork Board, and uh, I'm telling you, uh, this was a real catch, and uh, we're Thank awfully you. glad to have you on the Pork Board, David. Thank you. So David, uh, was, uh, until he joined us, professor of animal science at Arkansas State University. David's classroom instruction and research have an emphasis on meat science, which complements his experience uh, of owning and operating a farrow to finish Berkshire farm in Myrtle, Missouri. Newman Farm Heritage Berkshire pork markets directly to consumers throughout the United States. He is past president of the National Pork Board and has served on numerous task forces and committees. We're glad you could join us, David. More importantly, we're glad you're on the team. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And last but not least, uh, Kirsten Hafer. And Kirsten is another one that I've had the pleasure of working with in, uh, in previous uh, projects. And so we're awfully glad to have her on the uh, uh, National Pork Board as well. Uh, Kirsten leads the strategic and domestic market development team at the National Pork Board where she advises the pork industry, major packer and processors, and retail and food service operators how to win with pork and where to focus time and money. With more than 30 years of cross-channel experience, experience in retail, agency, broker, food service, food service operator, market research, and consumer goods manufacturing, she has fostered, uh, she has fostered and developed a trusted uh, relationship with most of the 500, uh, Fortune 500 companies, and especially in consumer goods. And I know that to be a fact, and, and uh, she is an amazing person uh, with the insights that she has. So uh, what uh, Kirsten has a tremendous uh, experience in is identifying high growth uh, opportunities to uncover and unlock potential, facilitate change, and measure expansion in uh, uh, products going into the uh, consumer uh, uh, production. Kirsten, thank you for your continued service uh, to American pig farmers, and welcome to today's panel. Before we get started, I just wanted to celebrate, and we'll be talking about this today, how this industry uh, has continued to improve the consistency of the center cut loin as demonstrated in the study that we'll be talking about. The meat case benchmarking, stu uh, benchmarking study completed by our producer-involved task force studied more than 100 stores in 16 major markets. Like Ian pointed out and shared in our introduction, these products came from different operations, processors, and supply chain partners. But this single product is improving in consistency with a 200% increase in subjective color tender and tenderness with 90% with 90% of the samples classifying as very tender research and genetics and innovation are paying off so it, 
hats off to you as producers for the improvement in the product and then hats off to our uh, processor, processor partners for the improvements that they've made in cold chain management and uh, processing uh, changes that they've made to improve the quality of pork. It's just amazing uh, the amount of improvement that we're going through and that's going to uh, uh, further enhance our abilities to sell uh, pork in the marketplace. So like I said, we're gonna start off with some uh, questions to the panel and, uh, and get their insight into uh, how we can do a better job in moving this important uh, primal for us. So first question is how is meat doing in the marketplace today, but more importantly, how is pork doing in the marketplace today? Sure, so I'm gonna kick that off. Uh, I am the geeky economist up here, so I'll try to keep it fairly jargon free. Um, but there's a 30-year title to this session. I'm going to keep it more recent than that. But what you're looking up here is some data that ended the end of May, and it's scanner data. And the punchline would be is across the whole meat case, we've had a pullback in retail demand, and pork is right in line with that. So there's not major differences between beef, pork, or chicken in that statement. Uh, to augment this slide, some of the other data and information that I have across my desk uh, would cross-confirm that. So I lead a project called the Meat Demand Monitor that is pork and beef checkoff funded. Uh, it would cross confirm that 10 days ago we put out a report that says the same thing. And I wanna interject here an important point, and this is not unique to pork, we're gonna focus on the pork loin here, but this is broader, is in my opinion, the reason demand has slipped in 2023 is macroeconomic oriented. So it's not a product quality issue. We haven't had safety issues and like things like that that in the past have led to domestic demand decline. Rather, it's a net affordability for the average U.S. consumer. So what I mean by that is wages for the typical resident in the U.S. aren't keeping up the cost of living, so their buying power has eroded over the last 18 months. Um, all my measures of domestic meat demand for beef, pork, and chicken, they peaked at different points in the middle of 2022, so we've had some slippage since then. That'd be my summary. But it's please note that's mainly a macroeconomic reality, not a product quality concern per se. So it's nothing that the pork industry itself can do. The pork industry can't change GDP or inflation rate and so forth. That's beyond their influence. But it can influence the quality of its chops, which is what we're going to talk about today. Yep. Yeah, and that would be that would be reinforced a little bit by Rupert's comments in the uh, the global marketplace as well. So. Yeah. Okay. Second question: What is NPB focused on that is creating new opportunity for pork? I'll take this one. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so what we're gonna start with here is, you guys saw in your uh, chairs there was a handout, and that kind of breaks down the basics of this retail benchmark project that we talked about. So there's much more information than just what we're seeing, but this really kind of breaks down the standards. So, you know, as what uh, Dr. Tonzer, what Kirsten's gonna talk about here uh, today in terms of demand, you know, one of the focuses here is, we're still talking about an edible product, right? I mean, every day I remind people that the only reason the pork industry exists, Bob, is because someone walks into a grocery store or goes into a food service establishment, they buy pork, they cook it, they eat it, and they like it enough to buy it again. And if that doesn't happen, none of this exists, right? The, the World that. Pork Expo does not <laughs> exist if we don't have a consumer eating our product and enjoying it. So when we talk about quality standards, which is the chart that you see here on the board, this is a, this is a time-tested chart of talking about the metrics we put around quality. Quality means a lot of different things, right? It means fresh. If we talk about international customers and consumers, it often means fresh and food safe. Um, in the retrospect of what we're talking about today, uh, we're talking about eating quality. Right? What matters when we select pork? What matters when we look at pork? And so from a meat science standpoint, it's things that associate with juicy, tender flavor, right? Those are the things that, 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 that have to do with palatability of pork. And if you look here, we have a lot of different metrics, but to break it down quickly, and one of the things that we look at in this project is, you know, Bob, we talk about this a lot with retail benchmark. Why do you go to retail? to benchmark. Uh, I'm a traditional meat scientist, so I spent most of my days in processing plants under very controlled conditions, very 
cold conditions also. So uh, looking at things like 24-hour pH and looking at color and all these other things. Well, a customer doesn't have a pH meter, right? We don't want them touching the meat either. The, the whole point of this study is saying if you take everything into account in the cold chain, you take everything into account in the entire farm to fork scenario, um, what does this product look like at retail? All right, that's really what it comes down to. We sort loins in the U.S. to export uh, abroad. Uh, approximately 50% of the loins that we produce, that you produce here, uh, end up in an international market. So one of those key markets for fresh loins is Japan. Um, we, we export a lot of product out of this country, but the bulk of what we consume is here. And so this is kind of just laying down this foundation. So if you look at this chart, what really matters the most is when it comes to pork, it's color. And you may hear that a lot, but color is very uh, highly associated with the eating experience you're going to have because it's going to be an indicator of its ability to bind water. It's going to be an indicator of its eating quality overall. So if you see the standards right in the middle of that chart, a one to six standard. And we're gonna talk a little bit about this today without, you know, you're not gonna have a test on meat science at the end of this, but uh, hopefully you'll know more. Uh, we use color as a primary indicator, whereas on the bottom you see marbling standards. If this were a beef lecture, I'd have them flipped, right? And I would talk a lot about intramuscular fat and the difference between select choice prime beef. We don't operate a system like that here because marbling is less associated with tenderness and eating experience in pork like it is in beef. Now, marbling is still important and we still quantify it because at the end of the day, fat equals flavor. Right? So there is a marbling component to talk about, but it's really mostly about color. So if we export loins, for example, into Japan, and most processing plants in the US do this, and they run loins across the line, they will actually have a visual evaluator standing there using these color standards right here. And anything that is, if they're trying to fill an order, let's just use Japan as our example, and they're trying to fill a Japanese order, they will select anything color score three and higher would qualify into a Japanese market. It would qualify into an international market. Anything less than a color score three, right, theoretically, ends up in the domestic supply chain. So this is an effort to quantify what is left after those sorts. Uh, what are we looking at in terms of the, the breaks? So when we talk about color, this is really uh, that important indicator. And you're going to hear a little bit more about that as we talk about it. Anything else that we want to touch on there? The one build I would have is that consumers are not technical. So we have to translate all of this into the eating experience. And that's really how the consumer engages. And it's our job to figure out how to make pork understandable. That's right. And that's part of the work that we do at the National Pork Board is what David's going to talk about is the technical aspects. And then we have to figure out how do we bring that to the consumer in a way that it changes how they think about pork and how they purchase pork. So you're going to hear us talk a little bit about how we do that today. You want to go ahead and next slide there, OK? Vaughn? Sure. OK, so if we just talk about the study basics, all right, again, when we go into uh, a retail store and we're talking about capturing this data, we, catch, we capture tons of metrics. So um, not only are we catching the quality metrics that we're going to focus on quite a bit today, things like color and marbling, we also look at how the case changes over time. You know, a, a meat case really doesn't change that much in terms of a retailer, in terms of length, right, or size or shape. It's really more about how does the case set change? So if we talk about other proteins, poultry, and we talk about beef, and we talk about alternative proteins, right, plant-based, for example, where are they at? Where are they positioned in the case labeling, right, whether it's uh, natural programs or it's some type of a specialty program or it's a store-branded program? We quantify all of those different pieces. But at the end of the day, right, the focus of this individual project is saying, how are we doing over time? We've been collecting this retail benchmark data on a three-year cadence since 2012. And to put this kind of uh, really bluntly, Bob, if we go back to 2012, we were consistently inconsistent. And so uh, we had a lot of variability in the supply chain. Um, this industry can totally change in just a handful of years. We know that. So uh, genetic influence, right? Other things we're doing in the production system uh, or packing and processing can change. But 2012, 2015, 
2018, right? We would have done it in 2022. We know what that, or 2021, excuse me, but we know what COVID did to everything, which, you know, really, Dr. Tondra, you were talking about, you know, how the case and demand has changed, right? COVID changed everything uh, of what we talk about today when we think about demand. So when we look at doing this again in 2022, the good news is we've really tightened this consistency piece that Ian mentioned in the very beginning, right? I mean, I talked about consumption. That's what this is really about. So we have tightened that up. And if you look at this break, and I mentioned the color scores to you earlier. So if you take a simple metric like color and you say, where are we at? If you were to go back to 2012, 15, for example, where we still enhanced most of the product we have by enhanced, I mean, we needle injected that product. Um, we were trying to do different packaging types of things like that. We, we have very little of that today, but if you just look at color alone, we've got about 60% of the pork supply now in the data that falls into this category of three or higher that I talked about, which would be more in line with what an export spec is. Now, that also means there's 40% of opportunity, right? And what we would hope is that in a follow-up benchmark study on that three-year cadence in 2025, that what we hope to do is that we're pulling off the bottom, okay? And then you say, why the loin? We use the loin as a primary indicator of overall carcass quality, okay? So in other words, if we have a very poor quality loin, something that is, has a lot of exudate or loses a lot of water and is very pale in color, uh, that is probably going to be associated also in the ham and the shoulder, right, and other product and muscle cuts that we see in the animal. Uh, but if you think about what you primarily see in retail, the other thing is, 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 is across the top of this banner, if you look at the approximate 125 million hogs we're going to process in 2023, and you take and export half the loins, that leaves about one and a half billion pounds of loins in retail. A billion, right? So. You know, if you think about opportunity for value, which is going to lead into this task force discussion that we're talking about now, the loin is 16 to 18% of the carcass, right? That's a lot. It's been losing money in the cutout for decades. That's the 30-year challenge that we titled this as. The, 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 the loin has been a loss leader forever. And so we're putting a, a really hard emphasis on this. And interestingly enough, we are also doing the same thing with our partners on the international side, U.S. Meat Export Federation. You know, they, uh, Dan Holstrom, their president at the meeting two weeks ago said, this is the year of the loin in Mexico. This isn't just about hams in Mexico anymore. This is also about loins and adding total carcass value. And we got to start with something the most important item we can start with is this loin item. So that's why we put such an emphasis on there. And we'll get to the why maybe here in just a minute, but it might be, you wanna add any color to this? You good? Okay, so when we talk about how we break this down, it really comes into you know, the why. Again, there's a lot of information here, but why are we improving? Right? Why are we improving consistency? It's a pretty bold statement when you're in science and uh, I bet economists really get nervous when you say things like 200% improvement. <laughs> right? That's a big shift. Big. And you say, wow, that, that doesn't even sound right. I mean, a 200% improvement. We have had a really crazy improvement in terms of what we've seen in terms of tenderness. You know, color, I love to brag on the 60%, but you know, when you have 40% that's still in that needs improvement bucket, we've still got a ways to go. But we're tightening consistency, we're making this stuff more tender, uh, Bob, so we're providing customers with something better. Unfortunately, we also see that we're consistently improving quality and consistently driving price down, and that's not good for producers, right? We're, we're really talking about this improvement. And here's the other piece. If you look at the why factor, over the last 10 years, when we talk about improvements, we've seen a significant change in genetics, okay? There's a lot of genetic companies here at World Pork Expo, and everybody's trying to sell something, right? Efficiency, quality, whatever. Uh, the point is, collectively, everybody is doing a pretty good job. When we talk about emphasis, whether that was breed influence or anything else, there's a lot of factors that come into that. But if we talk about genetics and then you combine that with what pork producers are doing and on-farm strategies, that's handling, that's transportation, um, it's understanding animal welfare, the basics, right? The simple stuff, the KISS theory, right? When we talk about PQA, pork quality assurance, uh, that's critical stuff. The example I always give, Bob, is that one needle one broken needle can cost us the entire Japanese market. We've seen that, 
right? So we talk about this simple stuff. It's beyond just the basic animal care and husbandry, but it's also this piece about understanding that what we're doing is playing an impact in improving product quality. Now you add in the fact that processors and packers have spent billions, billions of dollars in building new plants, investing in technology like CO2 stunning, uh, blast chilling. Uh, for if you're not familiar, once we bring those hogs in and we harvest them, the best thing we can do um, immediately to improve quality is to get that carcass chilled as fast as we possibly can. We want to bring that temperature down, and that has to do with a lot of the factors of the conversion of muscle to meat. So we've done that. We've expanded cooler space, and all of that is starting to come into fruition. I mean, I've sat in front of some much larger audiences than this and delivered some fairly bad news about being inconsistent in quality. And it's hard to have a discussion about where we go next on demand whenever we don't have a good grip on where we're at in supply. But that's a different story now in 2022 where we're actually telling a story of we're making this stuff better, we're providing customers with a better product, um, one that is right got taste and flavor, and we're not going to go anywhere else on that right at the moment, but we own that in the pork sector. So, a Very yeah. quick comment before you pass on, on it. We're focused on demand and quality in our discussion today, but it's easy to overlook and take for granted some of the investments you're alluding to. Mm -hmm. And there's been a lot of discussion in our society the last three years about resiliency in the food system. And I'm going to interject that those investments have also added resiliency right. beyond just quality. Mm -hmm. So there's multiple reasons those investments have been made and attendees here and those of you that have made those investments should not just be proud, but share the story. Because yep. it's not just quality, there's literally resiliency and throughput consistency yep. that's occurred because of that. Right. And I would just add that the loin is the key to all of the fresh pork portfolio of products because the majority of volume that's done at retail that consumers are buying are in chops and ribs. So if we don't get the loin right, if we don't get chops right, we lose that consumer in the fresh side of our portfolio. So it's a critical product that we figure out and we have to continue to drive volume while we capture value. So our foot is on the gas in promoting loins through all of the work that we're gonna speak to today. Um, and we're hoping that eventually we can go after some additional volume, right? Right. And you know, really get to a point where everyone sees the value, producer, packer, retailer. Okay, good. Any questions? Take a quick stop. Yes. So that's a lot, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you talked about macroeconomics. Here, let me yeah. give you the microphone. Do we have it? Sure. Uh, you spoke a lot about macroeconomics, um, the supply chain, the production chain. What is how do we approach the retail market side of things? Because pork has been priced very closely to beef, and we have a lot of pork in the freezer. And how do you start moving that through the marketplace and get that moving? Because if you want, there's, there's a limit to, you can make it up on volume. I get that, right? But the pricing at the retail side could be a lot, could be modified to create a lot more throughput to take advantage of some of the advancements and improvements that have been done in the industry. So what's being done about that? Well, it's good I handed you the microphone because <laughs> I'm going to answer your question. Um, so here's the reality. Um, for a number of years, we have pushed product into the marketplace. We have gotten shelf space. It shows up. We expect people will see it there and purchase it. And the reality is, is that there's a lot of competition out there, not only in other species and in the way the pricing structures and promotion structures work, but in the way that especially younger generations are eating. Sometimes we're competing for a meal occasion and it's outside of even the meat department, right? They could be grabbing Greek yogurt or peanut butter or nuts. Um, so we really need to focus on pulling it through at retail with consumer pull through. So it's not just about pushing product into the marketplace, but it's about creating that consumer connection to the product and reminding them 
that it's there and how to use it and when to use it and how it fits their lifestyle and their life stage. And there's a lot of times that we only use price and trade as the lever to get people to purchase. So we've got to move beyond price and promotion to doing other things that keep it front and center and top of mind. And that could be anything from recipes that show you five ways to cook pork chops when you maybe know one. It could be mapping to different cooking appliances. How many people in this audience own an air fryer? How many people cook pork in an air fryer? How okay, many, so how many of that group is over 50. <laughs> so, um, it's just it's segmented. That's my point. It is. So, I think would you say probably 30 hands went up for air fryer ownership okay. and maybe 10 for people that cook in an air fryer? And when you think about that, we are all in the pork industry and we're not even cooking in the air fryer. How can we expect a consumer to do it without helping them understand how to do it? So that's just one example of how we're trying to get around just using price as the primary metric to moving volume. Um, it's really about finding ways into the consumer's planning cycles, into the way that they shop, into the way that they do their meal planning. Um, even in the way that they act on impulse when they're in a store. So we're doing all of those things to create more value, and value is much more than just price. Um, it's really to create more value in the role that pork plays in how they shop and their life overall. So kind of a long answer, but that's happening at retail because that's where they've got the most exposure to our entire portfolio. And we've got to simplify that and help them understand how to buy it. And another thing that we work on as a team at the Pork Board is really helping make pork accessible. The younger generation, in, in large part, doesn't know what to do with a huge raw piece of meat. You show them a pork shoulder and they will tell you they have no idea what to do, right? So instead of maybe merchandising shoulder in the ad, or online, maybe we show them, you know what, on Tuesday you could have carnitas for dinner. And we kind of get to them through that visual appeal, leading with something that, you know, really does look flavorful and tasty and inspires them. And then secondary is, okay, what do I have to go buy to make that? So I think that's a lot of what we are focused on in trying to kind of flip the way we've always done things to be a little bit more relevant today. Thank you. Rather than add, we go to the next question. He's bringing your mic right there. Thanks. I guess my question is for you. For me? Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, um, I've worked for USDA now for several decades. I watch the pork cutout every day like a hawk. And there really hasn't been a time when the loin hasn't been a persistent drag on the cutout. And yet you're telling me that there have been these fantastic genetic improvements made uh, uh, to make it better. As a pork consumer, um, I, I still think I, I eat it and I like, I like loin, uh, but I still think it's too dry. <laughs> Why don't you throw some fat back in there? And I think um, it would add some taste. And I, I think it would make it a far more popular cut than it is now. Because if you can't uh, add some more value um, to the loin, we're cooked as an industry, I think. So, so, Bob, do you want to respond? Yeah, well, I, I, yeah, I will respond. So I was going to ask a question of everybody because that was the big, one of the biggest shocks that I had when I got on kind of the processing side of the business. So everybody, raise your hand if you knew that the loin has been such a drag on the, uh, okay, so a few hands. But not, what's that? We have to put more value in the loin. There's, there's no doubt about it. Uh, and, and that's exactly <laughs> what, what the, uh, the panel, you know, is talking about. And, and that's the quality. Not necessarily fat, but the water holding capacity that David's talking about really drives the, yeah. yeah. Well, can, can I take yes, this for please. a minute? I love you, by the way. 
Thank you. Thank you. I've been yeah. saying this forever. Hey, friends, to pull it, pull it out of the oven at 130 degrees. Use a meat thermometer. It'll improve things. It'll make it better. It'll leave it pink. But still. Okay, so let's just, since we're being really honest, right? I mean, we have gone through some phases in this industry, right? There was a time that pork really sucked. And no one in here is going to disagree with me because you've all had a bad eating experience at some point in the past, right? What I'm saying about genetic improvement is we know, we know where the industry has been, right? So that drag on the loin, I think, is, is historical when we drag it back 30 years. I mean, we've gone through some pretty tough, <laughs> don't, no pun intended, times on the loin, right? Yeah. But as we look now, that's actually the exact point. I mean, I say this. You and me are dead in line on this, and I say it every day. Like, this is the primary product we put in front of consumers. We are making it better. So I think what you're seeing now is better than what you've ever seen before. But here's the reality of this. And, you know, we have taught generations to put it on sale. There's no, it is not, uh, how many people in here are producers? Raise your hand if you're producers, right? You're involved in production, okay? A lot of you. It is not a compliment to me on Facebook to message me and say, you'd be so proud I bought dollar loins over the weekend. That's not a compliment to anybody in this room. That is an insult, right? Whenever you look at the price comparison against other proteins. And that's that's why we're talking about, right? Being bold, Bob, yep. <laughs> being bold. Amen, We've brother. got a big fix here. It's, it's tough. We have to stop thinking like a commodity and we have to be price makers, not price takers. You gotta stop selling low fat. You just gotta stop talking about that. You gotta start selling labor. God, this stuff tastes good. Well, we know that that is the top purchase driver to how consumers pr well, remove price, it's yeah. taste and flavor. Yes, so, thank you for you your comments. I, no, it's fine. No, you can, no, it's, yes. We're so good. if we could, let's move on to the next question. Uh, how is the National Pork Board balancing the needs of today with the long-term view of building demand? Well, I would like to start with, we didn't get here overnight, so it's gonna take us some time to get back to a place where we all feel like we can live comfortably um, in terms of volume and value, taste and flavor. Um, but what we are doing is managing to keeping the loin and pork in total, especially the fresh portfolio, top of mind with consumers. Um, and at the National Pork Board, we're playing a role in that by going out and having conversations with retailers to understand what they're trying to accomplish with their meat department goals, what they're trying to accomplish in pork, and then the role that specifically the loin can play in it. And there's some logos up here of some work that we've done across the industry. And a lot of the team that does that work is here. So they're standing against the back wall here. Um, if everybody wants to raise your hand that's on the team working on this work. Um, so. You know, it really comes down to we are pounding the pavement um, out talking about the pork industry and thinking about the category growth differently than they're doing on a day to day basis and different than the way that a brand would be approaching them. So it gives us a little bit of an opportunity to have a different discussion that allows for us to test and learn. Um, quite honestly. So we try different things with different retailers and we try to go after certain cuts like the loin. We try to go after certain consumers like multicultural consumers. We try to deliver different messaging like taste and flavor and nutrition. And we really see what resonates and what drives to more purchase, purchasing more often. Um, David talked a little bit about we want people to buy and repeat. We have very deep data in understanding where and how people fall off. In chops in particular, 42% of people that buy chops one time buy them a second time. The third and fourth time, it drops in half. So 42% of people purchase chops a second time, then it goes to 24%, and then it goes to 11%. So something happens. 
right? And we've got to keep them engaged and reminded that chops can be a great eating experience. And a lot of what we've been talking about is maybe we get beyond chop as a cut. Yep. Maybe chops have kind of become too ordinary. So how do we think about innovation? How do we think about recipes? And what you see up here on the right side of the screen are some of the things that we're doing to reach younger consumers who we know are buying more meat online than they are in stores. So we're giving them inspiration. We're leading with taste and flavor and visual appeal and bringing them into the option of pork. And then we're driving them to either add it to their shopping list or add it to their cart. And we're targeting them in certain regions. So it allows us to go after people that have maybe stopped purchasing or aren't purchasing as much as they used to. Um, so those are some things that we're doing right now to help drive demand in the industry as we talk about the long-term proposition and what we can go after in terms of bringing value back to the loin. Okay. So what is the path forward for pork? Go to the next slide. Yeah, so what I'll interject here, which is I paused on adding to the other ones because there's this misnomer that there's a U.S. market or that there's a U.S. retail and a U.S. food service and an export. Those are accurate statements, but there's still a lot of markets underneath those. And what this slide is just a call out if you guys, the fellow geeks in the room want this. Uh, we have lots of distinct markets across the country. One of the studies I was involved with, with Jason Lusk is what this is referring to, looked at 51 different retail markets around the US. Mm -hmm. And the punchline of what's up there is the Phoenix market is less price sensitive, specifically loin market, than the Chicago market. So if we found that and you believe that, if you're just trying to move volume, go to Chicago. If you're gonna make investments in some kind of value add claim to enhance the experience, go where the market's less price sensitive, like Phoenix, right? And it's not just those two, I'm just keeping it simple for today's discussion. But I think, A, it starts with measuring things better, which we've done compared to 30 years ago. Second is analyzing that better, which we do better today than 30 years ago. But the part we have yet to do is take full, full action on that. And the strategy to target Chicago shouldn't match Phoenix and shouldn't match San Antonio and so forth. You guys get the point. And that's all specific to the loin, because that's what we're doing here. But the relative ranking on price sensitivity is probably, I know it's different on belly and ribs than it is loin. So we need to get beyond just saying there's a US retail market. Now, admittedly, there is a cutout number, right? That's still an aggregation across all that. But the true experience of consumers is very diverse. I'm pretty sure Newman and I could take you to have a very high-end chop eating experience within 50 miles of here. And I bet if you gave us another hour, we could go to a real crappy eating experience within 50 miles of here. I mean, there's a lot of variation in every market. So that's all I'm trying to say on this slide. So we're picking our places strategically where we know either populations are moving or where we know there's declines in consumption at a state or market level um, so that we don't fall too far below where it's going to be recoverable. So working a lot with Dr. Tonzer, um, a lot with our data and our team that has line of sight into purchasing um, to really identify where do we have to go first and how do we prioritize? Okay, so what is the pork board doing different now than we did say 30 years ago? You go to the next slide. So to my point on measuring things, you guys have all heard the notion, you can only manage things you measure. I mean, I would say the pork board's better at measuring things. And this is a, I mean, all the slides I put in here are always geeky. That's my job as the economist. No, forward. But go one more, right, right there. there. So this meat demand monitor project that I alluded to earlier started in February of 2020. It's not a COVID-oriented project. It just happened to start a month before COVID uh, just because it took time to get it going. But the punchline I want to interject here is the insights on retail are different than the insights on food service. And Dr. Newman alluded to this earlier is we've definitely seen changes in those channels during the pandemic. And we're picking on the retail channel here, but the retail channel was really important during the pandemic. That's the reason I include this here, right? So we're not, we haven't talked a lot about food service, and there's definitely a role for food service in this discussion, but we shouldn't pick on retail too hard because it carried the day right, throughout the pandemic. Yeah, and I would say in terms of how we're approaching it, um, we've created a task force, and we've got different 
experts from across the industry. So we're assembling, and it's a pretty large group of folks. We've got producers, we've got subject matter experts from within the NPB organization, Think Nutrition, Multicultural Leadership, the data being represented, um, our sister organizations like MPPC, NAMI, um, we're all coming to the table to really go deep on what haven't we figured out? How do we understand what's happening in the international market? Innovation, the way consumers are embracing the loin, um, how they're preparing it, everything is on the table for discussion so that we can bring that learning to the domestic market and start to then uncover and unlock the growth opportunity that we've got. So it really comes down to we're taking the best and the brightest minds in the marketplace and bringing them together to attack it. And it's not just going to be a single year. It's not just 2023 that we're discussing. We're talking about a multi-year approach. And we know it's going to take multiple years for two reasons. It took us a long time to get where we are, number one. And number two, we've done some work and some other underdeveloped and underutilized cuts, specifically ground pork. And we're now in year four of that work. And we're just starting to see that work pay off and how it's showing up in retail. So this loin discussion is one you're going to be involved in for the next four to five years with us. You're going to come along on the ride. You're going to hear updates. You're going to understand how we're all working together. And really, that's the piece that I think is the most different is we're creating focus for everyone, for producers, for packers, for retailers, for food service operators. Everything is on the table, and we're all going to be talking about the loin for the next four to five years. Bob, briefly, what I'll add is something that's different today in 2023 versus 20, 30 years ago is there's less discussion about pork gaining on beef or pork gaining on chicken and vice versa. And bear with me for a moment as a geeky economist. Um, I think that's the right adjustment for the following reason is lots of research, and not just my research, other geeks around the country that do this kind of stuff, have found what we call the cross-price elasticity to be declining. So the change in price on, in the beef space or the chicken space has less impact on pork demand today than it did 10 years ago, than it did 20 years ago, than it did 30 years ago. And we can talk about why if you want. I won't take all my airtime on why that is. I firmly believe that. But to the extent that's true, and I believe it is, it is healthy for each species to try to do its best without just saying, I'm gonna go take your share. I think it's very short-sighted and less productive today to do that than it was 20 years ago, is the blunt statement. And I think that's a healthy development compared to 30 years ago. Yeah, good, thank you. So last question, and ma'am, um, I'm sorry I don't know your name, that asked the question to me about the, the pork. So Dr. that was a very great question, yes. and I appreciate the passion, okay? <laughs> These guys know that I've got that passion as well. So the question is this, so, and it was a great question to me. I am one of 60,000 of us, 60,000 pork producers. So you asked me that question, but you shouldn't just ask it to me, it should be me and my 60,000 partners in crime, okay, around? Well, I, I am sitting here, so I, I, deserve, I deserve that, okay? So because I am the one sitting up here representing our producers. But, so the question is this, what, how do producers get involved, mm -hmm. provide feedback, mm -hmm. or get any questions answered that they may have? Ooh, I'm going to start. Please. Can I start? You can click the next slide because I don't like them geeky slides. <laughs> so, uh, so here, you know, at there, I, I do want to back up just a little bit because there's, there's this thing about what are we doing. If you're in this room and you take away that we're only working on the loin, don't take that away from here, Amen. right? This is a loin discussion. That's yes. one piece. <laughs> Remember, 16 to 18 percent of the pig, but it's the, it's the, it's a, it's a loss leader. You said it yourself. I use that word all the time. It's a loss leader. You know, a matter of fact, I gave a talk three weeks ago and I put a price up there and I said pork ears, pork bungs and pork stomachs are all outpacing pork loins on price. Also not a compliment, right? But now there's have. a whole nother discussion <laughs> on variety meats, right? And how this actually works. The economist, he's shaking his head, he's like, okay. But the point is, it's just making a, a blunt comparison to say there's a lot of opportunities. So 
there is a lot of great work being done, right, in the international space, in the domestic space, on the human nutrition space. And what it really means is we got to reinvent pork, okay, because here's the reality. You know, I, ju I actually haven't started this new position yet, Bob, so <laughs> that's going to be soon, uh, the 19th of June. But uh, part of my whole point of, of getting involved in this is to think differently, okay. F take the loin away. We have not moved the needle on pork consumption in 50 years. Amen. It's 50 pounds, okay? I mean, it's per capita consumption has not changed. We're, we're flat, flat as a pancake if you look over time. We've got to stop doing the same old thing, right? And if you look at some of the data Kirsten has, which we're not going to get into today, it really suggests that we cannot do the same old thing in the long run. Pork could stand to be a loser in that. So if we own taste and flavor and we own our, our own position as a protein, we've got to go out and sell it. And that ties into this discussion of what can producers do, right? Yes. This isn't going to be solved by three people. I do love it that you pointed out to our volunteer president <laughs> 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 sitting up here. I love that. You didn't point yeah. at me. You pointed at Bob. That's great. So we're not going to solve it. We, we are going to solve it, right? I've had a lot of good discussions uh, this week. I mean, I eat, sleep, and breathe the pork business, you know, every day. So I have producers in mind. I've been, I, I grew up in a pork production family. I've been a producer my whole life. So I want what's best for pork. So, but this takes a collective effort on behalf of producers too, right? In my opinion, as a scientist and a producer, uh, we talk so much about efficiency, Bob. It's efficiency, 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 right? And we know right now the markets are not good, right? Input costs are high, you know, Times are not great when we talk about where we're at in the short run here. We've got a great future out in front of us, but we really do have to be bold and reposition pork as a protein. That whole taste and flavor piece, we are getting there. We're doing a better job. That's happening right now. But this takes a collective effort of 60,000 people buying into the same thing. You can't have one person buying into it or a handful of people. Everybody's got to say, hey, I want pork to live in its own space. Um, and we already do it, by the way. I use this example all the time. We talk about loins, 1.2, 1.3 billion pounds of point loins in retail. You know why we sort this stuff and export it to, to out of the country into premium markets? Why do we do that, Bob? Car uh, for dollars. We yeah. get paid more money for it. We are producing it. We get paid more money for it. Right? Imagine, take 1.2, take, just take a billion pounds. I just put a billion because I'm a farmer, not an economist. It's an easy number to add, right? <laughs> You take a billion and add a penny, that's $10 million a penny, right? So every dollar is worth a billion. If you cannot see potential in that, then you can't see growth, right? That's why we focused on the loin. I mean, it's got a lot of potential. So if we're making this thing better, making it taste better, we go in. We also focused on the loin because we know that's where people are in fresh pork, where they enter yep. and where they spend a lot of their time. And we know that in the next 10 years, there's a lot of volume at stake. Just to stay where we are, we've got to recapture lost volume. And that lost volume is primarily from generations and movement of generations. As boomers age out, as Gen X ages out, the consumption changes. As our products get to smaller sizes, volume changes. We've got to recapture all of that lost volume. And in order to do that, we've got to reframe how we've been positioning the loin and pork in total. And we have to do it in a way that it is relevant to Gen Z and millennial consumers. Because the way that we sold pork to boomers is not the way that we're going to sell pork to Gen Z and millennial consumers. Now, as, as a glass is half full comment, because I'm trying to be that guy instead of Dr. <laughs> Bear Economist, uh, one of the things we also know is as the generations get younger, the number of eating occasions per day goes up. So at the extremes, your typical baby boomer has the breakfast, lunch, dinner, the three that always gets talked about. But as you go younger, it's more likely it's four, sometimes four and a half eating occasions per day. The reason I highlight that is if the industry can adapt to that, right? Here's a portion size and convenience kind of comment, right? Some of those things got to be on the table to meet that consumer where they are. And, and actually, I think we will, right, is the point. But if you go to the next slide, um, the next one. So as we think about this loin task force and as we ask you for feedback, 
um, here's some of the areas that we're gonna dive into. It's some of the places that we know we have to work and address. It's everything from what's the role of pork, whether it's how do we fit into four or five eating occasions, you know, how do we eat anywhere, anytime, in any format. Um, we're very squarely in the fresh side and ready to cook. There's a lot of effort to take fresh pork and make it become something. So how do we think about balancing ready to cook and ready to eat? How do we think about the processed portfolio complementing and cross-selling between the two? Um, we're gonna figure out what the role of pork is and where loin fits in that. We're gonna think about innovation differently. There are so many consumers that are stuck in their ways. They can't think beyond a chop and that younger generation that, that Glenn's talking about is not a meat and potatoes generation. They are not a center of the plate pork chop with a starch and a vegetable. They think pork is an ingredient. So we've got to modernize and you know, we've been a little sleepy in the industry at times, especially on some of these core cuts. So we're gonna have that discussion and we're gonna talk about how do we shake things up. Um, innovation is a big opportunity. And you know, as something as simple as strips. Yeah. Right? Um, we're gonna talk about consumer education and maybe it's not education as much as how do we help them? How do we help them understand what to do with it? Um, you would think it's pretty easy to grill a chop, right? Or grill some meat cut on the grill. Well, consumers don't think that way. And then when you look at how many recipes are out there for other proteins versus pork, there's opportunity for us to just grab some of that low hanging fruit by telling somebody how to heat a grill, what to do to the piece of meat they're gonna put on the grill, and how long to keep it on the grill. I mean, it's as simple as that. We can't assume that anyone knows anything at this point, and we've gotta be helpful, not preachy. Um, and then the last is really telling them their story. You know, they want the full story. They want to feel good about what they're eating and where it came from. And they want to be guilt free. They don't want to be conflicted. So we've got to tell them about the investments and the progress and how that comes to be a product and the eating experience that accompanies that. And, you know, I think you said it earlier, this isn't just about retail. There's a lot of discussion about retail because that's where we've got direct exposure to consumers. Right. And it's the most complex to solve because we lose all control after the consumer purchases it and takes it home. But food service is much as retail is important to the future of the loin. You know, with the pandemic fine dining declined, it's the last segment to come back. That's where a lot of our chops were sold. So we've got to find ways to get pork into food service and different menu parts than just the fine dining segment and dinner. So I think all of that is on the table. And when we invite you to provide feedback, to ask questions, um, we truly mean it because this is all of us solving together on behalf of the future of the industry. Um, and I would say that in order to provide that, to get your questions answered, reach out to us at the National Pork Board. Anybody that's got a pork checkoff shirt, reach out to them, they'll get you to the right person. Anybody on my team that's here um, will be able to help navigate the questions. And you know, we really want you to be participating and active in this. Thank you. Okay, any questions for the uh, team? Thank you. So mine is kind of a two-part question. Um, first question, getting back to the whole fat issue. I'm wondering it, what kind of interest are you seeing from genetics companies in terms of producing an animal with more intramuscular fat, more marbling? And I realize that takes a long time to make that change. So uh, considering the producer aspect of it as well, how willing are they to do that? And then also, what are lobby groups at this point in time doing to show consumers that fat isn't necessarily the enemy in terms of health and nutrition? That's all you, you got. Oh, this you is... got the first one for sure. Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, all right, so first off, uh, let me say that not speaking, uh, I'll speak collectively about this genetics piece, right? We do know this, that over the last five years, there's been a dramatic shift in our industry on breed influence. We know that through 
not only the conversations we have on a daily basis with genetic companies, but we see it, we know it's there, not only breed influence, but also selecting on particular genetic traits. So I think that that plays a pretty strong case into why we are seeing significant improvement. We also know that there are genetic companies out here that are making specific trait selections on tenderness, also could be part of this significant change that we saw in tenderness 2018 to 2022. So genetic improvement is, is huge. So I think that collectively you are seeing an industry already. If you go out here, I mean, what better place than World Pork Expo? You go out here and start asking people about, well, what does this have to do with quality? Um, if you were to come here 10 years ago, it was only about efficiency. It was only about PSY, right? How many pigs can she have and how fast can they get to 280? Um, we see a collective different story now. And you know why? Because we have a system for sorting. I mean, we know that export value demands uh, premiums. We know that we have food service sorts. We even have some retail sorts in this country. So we're collectively getting better on that. The other thing, I think we've missed the boat on nutrition. We have put a huge emphasis on nutrition uh, started, we just, uh, National Poor Board just hired an entirely new nutrition team. Um, I think that especially if you look in comparison to others, some other things, we've missed the boat on nutrition. We're going to address this nutrition thing simultaneously and go beyond just super lean individual cuts. We're talking about all fresh pork and what role that plays in a healthy, nutritious diet. So that's a good question. Uh, yeah. All I wanted to add to your second comment or question, which isn't lobbying per se, but on the topic, was the majority of the U.S. public does want a fairly high amount of protein in their diet. So we're already there. That opportunity is there and that's good. But the other is a word of caution is several of you that are older than I am, I'm 42 just to get everybody on the same page here, can remember when butter and eggs have been good and bad and good and bad and good and bad, right? The narrative's changed. Um, it's very possible that specific to the role of fat in meat, it's gonna come in and out of favor in the medical community and therefore some in the general public. We have to accept the fact that what is quote unquote truth today may not be quote unquote truth in 10 and 20 years from now. That can be very frustrating, I'm well aware of that, but that's the reality we live in, right? So these discussions have a timestamp with them. Uh, you know, the desire of more fat in the pork chop might be different in 15 years is my point here. And it's very frustrating for the industry if the medical community is changing its tune, I understand that but I don't think the pork industry is going to influence the medical community. And we need to be aware of that as well. Thank you. Well, we're gonna try. Other questions? <laughs> well, you, you can That's try. Right. We're gonna try. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna say it. I've said it a million times and now I'm gonna say it publicly. Okay, I wish Kara was here to hear this, right? Think about this. I've said this forever. No numbers. Humans have been eating meat for how many years? Tens oh, of thousands of years, yeah. right? Oh. Diabetes, heart disease, and obesity has quadrupled in the last 80. Yeah. Just let that soak in. Yeah. Thank you, David. You're welcome. Any other questions? <laughs> last, last chance, yes. Go for it. That's all you. She's the queen of ground pork. <laughs> mm -hmm. I want a sash. Yes. Um, so there is no easy answer to that. The reality is, is that when we're going out into food service, especially into QSR, it's going to be pretty hard to penetrate a business that's established as theirs because they don't want to cannibalize, quite honestly, beef burgers, right? And there would be a lot of education associated with pork burgers. Um, there is opportunity, certainly, in ground pork specifically, and we're seeing more pork burgers be introduced in retail. Um, so we've been on a four-year journey, I mentioned, with ground pork, and as part of transforming the meat case and the ground pork set, we're encouraging retailers to actually put different forms of ground pork in, and, and patties are the number one form that they're putting in. So we're going to evaluate at retail whether or not pork burgers have a following, and that may help us eventually with a conversation in food service, but you know, to go in with something that doesn't have a following, that isn't a product that people are looking for, is a really tough sell. We are looking at other outlets. Um, we've got on the team a lot of focus on C-Store, 
and we're trying to think about C store as kind of our QSR and how do we get some pork products in those C store environments where they've got meal programs. Store Convenience store. Um, so you'll see some work there where we're trying to test some things. Um, so we're always talking about it. We know you all definitely want it. And every time we present, we have somebody ask that question. So we hear you, and uh, maybe someday we'll be celebrating that. But there's a pretty long journey to get there. The, the only thing I'll briefly add is roughly 10 years ago when the beef industry was shrinking, the last <laughs> round of a drought pull down, Arby's made some adjustments because it didn't have the amount of roast beef it wanted. Turkey got added and so forth. So things can change. I mean, I agree with everything that she shared with you, but just because the situation was a certain way five years ago doesn't mean it will be in 10 years. So. As an industry that's using a pork loin to be a loss leader is not saying much for the rest of the pork product. We're using our best cut of So, so there's a lot to respond to there, but I'm going to respectively push back on the assumption that it's the best. You and I probably think it's the best, but I promise you I could find you a bunch of U.S. residents that would say bacon is the best product. Well, besides bacon. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 then I could take, but then I could take you to Mexico and find several that would say ham is. Yeah. So where I'm really going with this is back to my earlier point on we have a lot of different sub-markets. I mean, if you followed my comment about 51 cities, it's at the cut level as well. Now, that doesn't dismiss your point. We need to add value to the loin. I concur with that, but I would not use it as a motivation to just presume that it's the best cut because it's all in the eye of the beholder if it's the best one or not. And we definitely shouldn't try to make it the best one at the cost of bacon or ham or something else. That's the reason I'm interjecting there because there's some strategies you could think about doing that, and that won't get the pork producer ahead if you gain loin solely at the expense of another cut. So we need to not go down that path. Yeah. yeah, that's my word of caution is the point. Question over here. I think one of the one of the first slides we saw showed that our best cuts are being exported. Um, I'm new to this industry. Uh, as a consumer, when I walk into um, a grocery store, uh, the the cuts, the chops are are paler. I've never seen anything that pink up there. So, so just a reflection. I can tackle that. It's getting better, right? Retail products getting better. I mean, we, if you're new to the industry, if you think it's bad now, you should have seen it 10 years ago, right? That's kind of the point of where we're going here. But I would say that it's not that our best cuts are all getting exported, uh, but that rather that we're sorting a lot of that really good product off, right? But there's still a tremendous amount of that left domestically. I mean, you know, we tend to talk and it's really appealing to talk about exports, right? When you start talking about going to Japan and Korea and, and different parts of Asia and, and Central America and everywhere else in the world, but we cannot forget we consume 70% of that product domestically, right? And that's the big piece. I mean, we've hung ourselves uh, for so long on this discussion about exports that you really got to think about what U.S. consumers are getting their hands on, and you got to think about that the bulk of that product stays right here. And I want to talk a little bit about the variation. Not all retailers and not all stores within a retailer are created equal. So it really depends on where you're buying. Every retailer thinks about purchasing differently. Some are program customers, which means they've got a contract with a specific supplier that supplies all of their fresh pork. And when they do that, there's definitely more consistency in the product that you're purchasing through that retailer. There's other retailers that just wait until a supplier has product they want to sell and they try to buy it Price. for pennies on the dollar, right? So if you are shopping in a retailer that is a bid and buy situation, your consistency and quality is much different because you're not getting the best product at that point in time. So that's a big component. You really have to think about, from a consumer perspective, 
a lot of what shows up and how it shows up and the quality and the color and everything that you're, you're speaking to is really the quality of the meat program that the retailers invested in and how they're making their selections, number one. Number two, we haven't even talked about this. Um, there's a big difference in quality and we expect quality to continue to get better. And in 2025, we expect that we would see improvement just by virtue of a lot of retailers are moving to case-ready product, which means they are not cutting it in the store and they are not overwrapping it in the store. So it's yeah. going to be determined what the quality and overall consistency is back at the plant, at the packer. And that is gonna be shipped to the store, which will increase and become more consistent over time as well. And I don't know if you wanna No, that's it, I mean, the, the case is changing. And listen, we, we have a long ways to go, right? Yeah. Packaging, uh, you know, what we're offering to consumers, cuts, that's yep. this whole dynamic around the loin task force piece is, we just need to rethink this entire thing. But consistently, yeah. we are improving the consistency piece. And so I think that that's going to be kind of the mainstay on where we build a foundation for this loin task force yeah. and move forward. It's all in an effort in finding added value, right, for the producers that we work for. I mean, we, we know that loins have their challenges. We know that ham, bacon, right? Thank God for bacon. How many times do we have to say that? But, you know, we can think beyond the belly when it comes to taste and flavor. That's a pretty good way to sum this up. We got to think beyond processed meat and bacon and think about fresh pork because there's a ton of it out there and we've got a great position for it moving forward. So you just quoted our African-American multicultural strategy. That's right. <laughs> taste and flavor. Yes. Thank you. The, because this is a task force and there are so many stakeholders in this and we've been kind of focused on retail, I'm curious about the buyers for the meat case in the retail environment. How important are they as a stakeholder and how do they tra treat pork compared to beef, compared to chicken? I'm just curious. They are very important because they need to understand what sits under all of it, right? So when they see a brand come through their door to their desk and they're evaluating one brand over another, it's going to be important that they understand all the things that sit under it in terms of investments and things like that. Um, we do have stakeholders that are in that procurement space that will be weighing in throughout this task force so that we can understand yep. the margin component of what their targets are. Um, certainly, and your, your part two to that is how does pork buy versus beef? You know, in a lot of retailers, and this is a little scary, and this is where our team is really active in the marketplace on behalf of the industry. Um, this is a real story. We have a retailer that the person that's purchasing pork was buying towels prior to being moved to the pork desk. They know nothing about meat. They know nothing about meat quality. They know nothing about pork other than they eat it, right? So we're going in as the historical knowledge, and I will tell you, um, you know, I've got Elaine and Jim back there in the room in the blue shirts. Um, they become the experts that those retailers tap into to start to make decisions because these are people now that are new to meat, new to pork, and they're managing the business on a spreadsheet. They're not taking into account anything we're talking about here. They're not taking into account any of the historical or any of the existing quality, right? So it's our job to make them understand why that's important and they have to think beyond an Excel sheet of what their margin and profitability is. That's the reality. So when you take that, you've got people on the pork desk, you've got beef, you've got poultry, and then you've got somebody that oversees all of it. So they're not necessarily making decisions based on what beef is gonna do and what poultry is gonna do. They're working in a silo in many cases with a VP that sits over all of meat and seafood that has line of sight. So our team's really out influencing as much as we can to ensure that they understand how complex meat is, how complex pork is, and the role, and honestly, the role in the meat case and why it's so valuable. And we're trying to get them out of what they've already done. So a lot of their pricing strategies are, 
year over year, they have to move the same amount of volume through their stores to make themselves profitable, which means they don't really think about what they did. So you talked about, and we had a couple of questions about dollar loins or 99 cent loins. It's because that's what they've always done. And if they change their pricing strategy, they may sell less, which means they don't hit their profit margin, which means they don't get paid bonuses, or potentially they're at risk for losing their jobs. Right, but to reiterate that, we need to recognize, like I, I'm the heterogeneity guy up here. There's a lot of variation, different examples. In the retail space, there's a lot of difference across companies on the relative role of meat, and even within that, the relative role of pork. And to make this point, back to a couple other questions that came up, we could walk into almost every major grocery store and find a box of Cheerios. But in a big city, if you give me a four block area, I bet I can find a dollar fifty variation in the price of Cheerios on that two block area. And the reason is the role of Cheerios, for some is to drive foot traffic, mm -hmm. and for others it's to make a buck on every box. Mm -hmm. The relative role of Cheerios differed across them is my point. The same thing holds on loin, and more generally meat, right? Why am I highlighting that? Some retailers, the way they currently approach it, are gonna be more receptive of a higher quality product where we're asking for a higher price, mm -hmm. where others don't see that as part of their business model. And we need, step one is to recognize that. Right, is the reason I keep it interjecting this. Not all stores are equal, and that's okay. We're a country of over 300 million people. Why would we expect them all to be the same, right? Yeah. But certain retail partners are more likely to be partners, yep. and others are foot traffic driven. Absolutely. And that's okay. Yeah. Right? I'm not saying it's wrong, but we need to be aware of that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and we know that, and we go in and work with them based on their go to market strategy. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'll give one last question, then we'll go. Nothing? Thank you for the questions. They were great questions. Yes, Appreciate it. David, Kirsten, Glenn, thank you so much. Let's give yeah. them a round of applause for yeah. everything that they did. Thanks. Very good information, and we have a lot of work to do, right? Yes, we okay. do. Okay, thank you all. Have a good afternoon. Sorry.